guys, welcome back to Nadir Audio. Today we're going to be taking a look at the amazing Bayou Rizong A10 integrated tube amplifier. Alright, so I've actually been interested in tubes for uh, quite a long time, but my first experience with them was way back in the early 90s, and it actually was with a guitar amplifier. Uh, so I had uh, picked up a used Mesa Boogie Mark III, and uh, that was my main guitar amp for about 20 years. I really love that thing. Um, the only drawback is that it did go through tubes uh, pretty quickly. So during the times that I was in bands, you know, I'd have to change them about every six months, which was kind of a pain. Uh, but, you know, when you threw a new set of uh, groove tubes in that thing, it really sounded amazing. It had a great tone. And so, yeah, my, my first experience with tubes was very positive, And, you know, I always thought they kind of looked cool, and I liked sort of the retro thing, too. Uh, so, I guess it was probably in the early 2000s that I started thinking about getting a, a stereo tube amp uh, for a hi-fi. And at that time I was really into vintage gears. I was getting a lot of solid state stuff, trying it out. Uh, you know, early days of eBay I picked up a few things. And at that time I had thought a lot about getting one of the more affordable vintage tube amps at that time. So like a, you know, a Fisher 500 or or like a Dynaco Stereo 70 or something like that. And so I looked at a lot of those, uh, but I think what it really boiled down to was that, you know, for the solid state stuff, you could spend 100, 200 bucks to get something you'd always wanted to try out. And if it turned out that it, you know, it, uh, that it had problems that weren't advertised or it broke down right away, uh, it wasn't a big deal, you know. But with the tube amps, even at that time, you know, I think ones that were in working condition and weren't cosmetically too bad, you know, would start around five to eight hundred dollars and go up from there, and uh, you know that's a lot to to spend if you're kind of taking a gamble on will this thing actually work or does it have issues that haven't been disclosed? You know, am I going to have to have it serviced a lot? That kind of stuff. So I just never pulled the trigger on that. So it wasn't actually until 2017 when I picked up uh, the Shit Valley 2 headphone amp uh, that I finally got a stereo uh, tube amp. And if you guys haven't seen my video on getting into headphones, I'll include a link to it in the description below. Uh, but yeah, I love that uh, Shit Valley 2. It's a great little headphone amp. Uh, but you know, it is a hybrid amp, so it's it, you get some of that tube coloration, but it's not really the full experience. So I was hoping to maybe try out one of the newer amps to, uh, you know, do uh, actually listen through speakers. And I toyed with the idea of getting one of those gem tune amps that were kind of popular for a while around that time. Um, but it just seemed like every time I wanted to pick one up, they weren't available on eBay or Amazon. Uh, I think you can get them on Amazon uh, at the moment, about $180. Uh, but of course, since then, a few months ago on Zero Fidelity, uh, we all found out about this guy, the Boyo Rizong A10. Uh, and this seemed like, you know, a real serious old school uh, tube amp. So yeah, this definitely caught my interest. And so for the last few months, I was just, uh, you know, waiting to, to pick one up. And the only other one I was considering was the uh, Musical Paradise MP301 Mark III uh, that was on uh, Thomas and Stereo. Uh, that also piqued my interest. Um, and I was kind of curious what Thomas was talking about when he was talking about sort of the new tube sound versus the vintage tube sound. Uh, but I thought to start, uh, I would just uh, go with this kind of uh, older school um, amp just to get the real tube experience and then kind of go from there. Uh, so I bought this for my birthday for myself uh, last month. And uh, yeah, it's it's great. So yeah, let's take a little closer look at it. Okay, so our A10 comes with this kind of nice tube cage here on the front that you can use to protect the tubes. I actually prefer the look of it a little better with the cage off. And since I keep this up on a high shelf in my listening room, I don't have to worry about the animals getting to it or anything like that. So let's go ahead and take this off and then we can take a closer look at what's going on inside. Uh, so we do have our two power output tubes. These are both EL34s and these are what give it its kind of classic rich and warm tube sound. Uh, we do also have a single rectifier tube here in the center. That's a 5Z4PJ. And then we've got our two little 6N2J voltage amplification tubes here and here. Uh, and that's really it. Uh, we have a couple of controls here in the front. We have a power switch, which comes on with a nice satisfying click. And then we have our volume knob over here on the right. So there are a couple of cool things about how this was built. 
One is that it does have a self-biasing circuit built in. So if we want to change these tubes at some point, we don't have to worry about re-biasing the unit. It should do that automatically, which is very cool. So I will be doing some tube rolling with this and we'll take a look at that in some future videos. Uh, the other cool thing is that a lot of this thing was built using point-to-point -point wiring. Uh, so typically with uh, more inexpensive gear, uh, everything would be based around a printed circuit board. So it's unusual that you would find an inexpensive unit that has a lot of uh, discrete electronics in it. Uh, so that's also very cool. And it does feel very well built. Uh, this thing's very heavy. I think it's about 26 pounds. So it's definitely heavier than it seems. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and turn this around off camera and then we can take a look at the back of the unit. Okay, so as you can see over here we have just uh, two separate inputs. One's labeled auxiliary, the other one's labeled CD. And then there's a switch on the back here that you can use to select one or the other. So uh, we're only going to be using uh, one input here, uh, the auxiliary. And I'll show you guys how I have that set up in my main system here shortly. Uh, and then we just have our jacks for the speaker connections. Uh, so we have uh, these two here are the grounds, uh, so we can plug our ground into that. And then because this is actually a tube amplifier and we have output transformers, uh, we actually have two separate uh, positive terminals here uh, for uh, different impedances. Uh, so we have a 4 ohm and an 8 ohm. Uh, and I'm using 8 ohm speakers and all the listening I've been doing so far, so we would connect ours uh, right here like this. Uh, so a lot of times with these uh, lower end tube amplifiers, there will just be uh, one set of jacks and they'll just make it 6 ohms, so kind of split the difference. So it's kind of nice that this one has been designed so that you can uh, get 4 or 8 ohms uh, with a separate connection. Uh, and that's really all there is to the back, so let's uh, go ahead and take a look at this uh, in my main system. So I did want to mention that this thing came pretty well packed. It was double boxed. It had a lot of extra packing material, and the tubes themselves came in individual cardboard boxes, but they had a little bit of padding in each one, and then those were inside of the tube cage, which was attached to the amplifier. So everything was pretty tightly packed in there and wouldn't move around during shipping. So if you were concerned about it being shipped, uh, it's probably not something you have to worry about uh, so much. Now you can get these directly from China Hi-Fi and save a little bit of money, uh, but I actually ended up getting mine from the Tube Amplifier Store on Amazon. Uh, so the advantage there is you can get it a lot quicker, and if you do have a problem, you can send it back to them and they'll just send you another one instead of having to get it repaired, uh, which was nice. And also I have an Amazon Prime account, so I was able to get the free shipping, so that saved a little bit. Um, so you could probably go with either option and it would work out just depending on how much you want to spend and, and the convenience level. Um, but yeah, we have um, our amp set up here in the listening room. And we're running into the auxiliary on this uh, straight from this vintage Mitsubishi receiver, which uh, I'm using as a tuner, and then I'm using it as a source selector uh, for other stuff. So the auxiliary on the Mitsubishi is connected to our shit Mod E3 DAC over here. And then running into this, we have a CD player. I just have this uh, inexpensive Ankyo CD player, which is fine as a transport. I'm not crazy about the DAC that's built into it, which is why we're using the Mod E3. And then we have my MacBook Pro over here, which we're running into the Mod E3 as well. Now, I, I do actually have my turntable set up as well, but it's running in directly into the Mitsubishi. So I haven't really done any vinyl listening because it's, while it's a fine phono preamp built into this thing for a vintage piece, it's not nearly as good as the one in the Sprout, which is what we're normally listening to in here. Uh, so I didn't really want to spend a lot of time with that until I have a good external phono preamp to use. Uh, so for all the listening I've been doing, it's just been uh, the radio and CDs and listening for my MacBook. And then for speakers, we're using my Kef LS50s, uh, which are the main speakers I use here in my listening room. Now you wouldn't expect these to be a great combination because the amp is fairly low power. I think this is 6 watts per channel 
and these are pretty inefficient speakers. I think they're 85 dB sensitivity at one watt. Um, but that being said, they actually work surprisingly well, uh, much better than you might think. Now, you're not going to be able to get them super loud or, or you know, rock a party or anything like that, but they get plenty of loud for doing the kind of uh, listening that I do here in this room. Um, got kind of a midfield, near field setup going on in here. Uh, and it works great for that. It gets as loud as I, I want it to be. Um, but it also just, this combination just sounds really good. Now, for the amp itself, uh, I guess I was sort of expecting this thing to have a bit of an A curve, uh, kind of like a, more like a, some of the vintage stuff I've heard in the past. Uh, but that's actually not the case. It's actually a bit more like a V curve uh, with the uh, treble and the bass being slightly boosted uh, and you know the the mid-range fairly neutral so in that respect it's actually uh, very similar to what we get with the Sprout when the bass boost is turned on um, but that being said these these amps have a very different uh, character as you might imagine uh, so what are my general thoughts on this well uh, you know it does have that sort of classic sort of warm really rich sound um, but there's a lot of other stuff about it that, you know, I w was surprising to me. So it actually does have a fair amount of detail. It's not quite as resolving in the t high end as the Sprout is, um, but it's plenty of detail to really enjoy a recording. Now, for the soundstage, it's it's actually pretty good soundstage. It's, it's plenty wide. It's just as wide as the Sprout, but it's not quite as deep. So uh, when I'm listening about six feet away from these speakers, uh, the soundstage, you know, extends just behind the wall a little ways, but it doesn't go several feet beyond the wall like the Sprout can do on certain recordings. Um, but uh, the, the really, uh, the thing that I notice the most with this is just there's a sense of space in the room. Uh, so if you're listening to recordings that have a really good uh, room sound, uh, this thing's kind of amazing with that. You, you get this space around everything that you're not used to. Now, you know, it's not as big of a sound stage and it's maybe not quite as pinpoint accurate um, but you sort of forget about that because it's so spacious sounding uh, it gives a sort of illusion of transparency this may not be the most transparent amplifier you'll ever use but uh, it for me it does have this real sense of kind of getting back to uh, the original recording and sort of being there especially with uh, live recordings so when I first set this up, uh, I was listening to a lot of classical music on the classical station we have here in Austin, Texas. And I've actually discovered a lot of cool stuff via the radio and other sources, which I'll share with you guys uh, in an upcoming video. Um, but I was really struck with, um, I guess what you would call an engagement factor. Uh, like I really don't encounter listening fatigue with this thing. Uh, and I feel sort of a an emotional attachment to music I like, um, a stronger attachment than I might listening on other things. Now, I don't know exactly what that is. Uh, maybe it's more second order harmonics and less of the higher order harmonics. Uh, I think there's something that's more than just the sort of spaciousness and also that sort of classic warmth you get with tubes. Uh, but I haven't put my finger on exactly what it is. Um, but I like it a lot. It's, it's kind of intoxicating to get... Um, to listen to this thing and listen to a lot of recordings that you've heard before as well and uh, kind of hear them in a new way. Uh, another thing I've been listening to a lot on this is the MA recording sampler that the Audiophiliac made available. Now not everything on this uh, album are up my alley musically, uh, but there's a few tracks on here that um, I really like. There's the um, Marvin's Udu Voodoo by the Antenna Repairman. Uh, they're just playing, the Udu is kind of a uh, ceramic percussion instrument, and they're playing a bunch of other ceramic instruments. It's just a very cool recording, but with this setup, it's just, there's just a sense of the room and sort of the, that kind of ringing of the ceramic, and there's, there's just a realism to it that um, I really like that I couldn't quite get. Now, on the Sprout, you might hear a little bit more detail uh, on textures and things, but... I don't know, there's just something about this amp where it really kind of sounds great. Uh, there's a lot of other great tracks on here. Uh, the track Gears by Mark Nassif, uh, where he's just playing drums. That sounds amazing. You get this great room sound. It's really cool. 
There's this Gregorian chant with uh, Peter Epstein, uh, which is cool, and they, ha they have sort of a horn instrument as well as the chant going on. Uh, the last track is, is very interesting. Uh, there's also this uh, Michel Godard uh, track, which I like a lot, where they're using sort of a, a really old school um, horn instrument, I think called the Serpent. Uh, so if you haven't checked this out, I'll include a link to the video that Steve Guttenberg made about that. But you definitely want to check it out. I mean, these recordings are, sound better than any recordings I've ever heard. It, it sort of whet my appetite for checking out other really serious audiophile recordings. Um, but I have listened to a lot of other stuff. Uh, so let's see, I listened to, um, I pulled out my copy of Jazz Samba by Stan Getz and Charlie Bird. This is probably the first jazz, it's definitely the first jazz album I ever got into. I first heard it in the 70s when I pulled it out of my parents' record collection. And one of the things that always struck me about that recording is that not only is it a good recording, but it has a really great room sound. It's like that was recorded in a church. And so that just kind of struck me as, oh, hey, I, I want to check that out on this. And yeah, it didn't disappoint. It actually, uh, on this and the LS50, sounded better than I'd ever heard it. It's just, uh, uh, it's kind of like rediscovering the recording. And it's a really amazing sounding recording. Uh, let's see, see, I also listened to, uh, you know, Time Out by Dave Brubeck and... All you audiophiles out there are probably sick, sick to death of that uh, recording, uh, but I still like to listen to it on occasion, and it is a really great sounding recording. Um, I listen to a lot of other stuff, other genres. I listen to 17 Seconds by The Cure, which is one of the, my favorite albums from the 80s, and that's not a great recording, but it, it is actually a very good recording, and I feel like this thing really kind of helped pull out that really cool atmosphere that that album has, and you know, honestly, I'd say I, listening to it on this uh, system, it probably sounded better than I'd ever uh, heard it before. So that was really cool. Um, I did try to listen to some uh, heavier stuff, some heavier electronic and some uh, rock, hard rock, classic rock. You know, so I did listen to all of Led Zeppelin too on this thing. And uh, it's interesting. It actually works it works a little bit better than uh the sprout does with the ls 50s now the sprout can rock out um it just it's just not my favorite amp with the ls 50s it worked really well with the elag b5s i had before and i want to try it out with some other speakers um but it just for classic rock it just sounds more correct there's just something about it where you can get into it more it sounds like it, it sounds the way it's supposed to sound in a sense now, with that being said, you know, th this setup with these speakers doesn't have great dynamics and it can't get really loud. And so it's it's not muscular enough that you, it's going to be the best you've ever heard recordings like that. Um, but it was surprisingly good. And, and I actually did like it better, again, with the, the Sprout with the LS50s. Uh, so I've been listening to all other kinds of things. You know, I'm still exploring. I've just been listening to this for a few weeks. And I'm going to continue to explore it. Uh, I think in general that... Uh, I'd like to keep this in this room. I actually think it sounds really good in this room with the LS50s. You know, we will explore other speakers. I do have other more efficient speakers. I have some different clip speakers that we'll try it out with. Um, but I do, I think what I want to do in this room is, for now at least, is keep the, the tube amp in here uh, and then have a setup where I can switch between the tube amp and another kind of more muscular amp. So I think I'm going to move the Sprout into one of my setups in the other room and then maybe get, uh, you know, kind of a kind of more heavy-duty Class AB amplifier, something like a shit Vidar or, uh, you know, maybe that um, Outlaw Audio uh, receiver. I can't remember the RR 1060 or something like that. Um, and, you know, I, I, I have the feeling that uh, these LS50s can get the lead out. I think it's just uh, you need some kind of beefier, maybe Class a, B, or, or maybe just a higher end class D uh, amplifier to do that. Um, but yeah, the tube amp, uh, I love this thing. It's definitely a keeper. I'm, I'm interested in exploring a lot of other recordings I have with this thing. And we'll try it out with other speakers as well. And we'll do some tube rolling in the future. And uh, yeah, I think there, there's a lot that we're going to do with this thing. I'm very happy I bought it. Uh, thanks to uh, Zero Fidelity and Steve Guttenberg for featuring this. Otherwise, I probably would have never heard of it. Uh, and yeah, I think that's it for this one, guys. Uh, thanks for watching. I'll see you in the next video.